G'day there, Mick Meredith here, comedian, musician and podcaster, and I'm doing the opening spot on the Andy Social Podcast. He's coming up in a minute, settle down. If you don't know me, Mick Meredith, uh, I tell jokes and sing songs. Uh, I've put out a couple of tunes recently on Spotify, one called Rod, all about my girlfriend's love for another man. Oh yeah, that's funny, we all laugh about it. Another tune about turning 50 called Hitting the Half Century and Growing Old Disgracefully. So check them out on Spotify or whatever platform you listen to. Got some other projects coming up soon. Uh, a new song coming out called Where's the Effing Remote Control? I think we can all relate to that. But right now, tune your ears in to the Andy Social Podcast. Cheers, big ears. Howdy, folks. Episode 297 of the Andy Social Podcast is here. And my guest on this episode is Chris Angsty. Chris is an Australian basketball legend. And I know I've said that a bunch of times, but I guess, I guess I've had a few Australian basketball legends on the podcast, hopefully a few more in the future as well. But Chris, Chris is incredible. Uh, what, an, what an incredible career he's had. He, he's played in the NBL. He had a really successful NBL career. Um, you know, some of the accolades include uh, two-time NBL MVP, grand final MP, MVP twice, uh, three-time NBL champion, um, five-time all-NBL first team, um, and then a bunch of other accolades that I could keep waffling on and, and on and on and on. Um, he had a career in the NBA as well, um, playing for the Dallas Mavericks and the Chicago Bulls. Uh, amazing stories from uh, from being over there and uh, playing in Russia as well. So he's just, there's so many things here. And if you've been following Chris on the socials for the past year or so, you would have noticed that he started to share some of these stories and they are absolutely fascinating. And what that has now become is, is a book, which is out now called Tall Tales. It's available uh, via his social media pages. And I'm going to have a direct link in the description or the show notes for this episode. So you can just click right through and pick up a copy yourself. But uh, we just scraped the surface here. Just a few little, little, little carrots uh, of these stories that uh, you can chomp into it and get a taste of, of what's to come. There's just some fantastic stuff that uh, he's experienced and he's now sharing in this book. So check it all out. Um, but just uh, an incredible guy. And uh, once again, it's my childhood rushing back. It's just incredible and surreal to be speaking to to, to Chris and just another another amazing person to, to tick off the list as far as a, a, a fantastic anti-social guest that's been on the podcast so far. So enough crapping on from me. Please enjoy this great chat with the man himself, Chris Angsty. Yesterday, I was trawling through Facebook trying to find that story that you posted last year about, uh, well, the appendix, appendix story that you had uh, in Russia. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's such a cracker of a story. And I might get, I might indulge you to to share that again uh, if you can. But um, as I was scrolling through all these posts trying to find it, I was in the Facebook search and I found a post from Adam Thompson from Chocolate Starfish. And yeah. <laughs> maybe I saw maybe I saw the connection sometime in the past, but I had Adam on the podcast uh, a few months ago. And okay. um, it's just a really odd matchup um, with yourself and him and obviously being friends. And he had posted about how he went over to Russia to, to spend some time with you. How, yeah. how on earth did you become friends with Adam from Chocolate Starfish? Uh, well, Adam was a basketball fan back in the day when I was at the South East Melbourne Magic. And we got to know him and, yeah, be became friends through Arm Tour and Red Dust Role Models. And we travelled up to the Northern Territory a bunch of times together spending time in remote communities and uh yeah became really good friends um and he was one of the you know when you say to people come and visit me in russia a few loved the idea he was one who was uh yeah open enough to come and do it so that was a great time yeah i enjoyed his post because it certainly it certainly was in line with some of your experiences as far as just the harshness and and the extremes of, of this country. And I think it's I think for a lot of Aussies, you don't often get an invitation from somebody to say, "Hey, come and visit me in Russia." So uh, <laughs> good on him for, for taking the plunge. Yeah, absolutely. It's the sort of thing we've both done, I suppose. It's you say yes to things more often. You know, it's really easy to say no. So uh, when something when something that unique came up, it was a really easy one to say yes to. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Well, um, can I can I indulge you just to share a bit of this story of uh, of the the whole appendix issues in Russia because I think it sort of frames a lot of the the experiences and obviously you know we'll talk about the book as well. But um, what what on earth happened? Uh, well, uh, literally, I, I came back from a, a European road trip and we had a game on a Wednesday night and. 
sort of all through the night when we when I got back to my apartment in Kazan, my you know, felt like I had stabbing pains in my stomach. And anyone who's had an appendix burst will tell you it's it's not a comfortable thing. Um, it hadn't yet burst, but um, one of the things you don't do over there is mispractice. And I, I sort of by the time eight o'clock rolled around in the morning, I'd hardly slept, and I, I, I got. Martin Merced, who was the other English-speaking European and a friend of mine to call the team doctor because I was going to need him to, to give me clearance to not train and I was trying to figure out what it was. And he came to the house and you know, the only words I understood him saying were hospital. And so we got into the back of this little tiny white car and he drove me to what looked like a, a wooden double-story building, which turned out to be the hospital and and we went into a room with the surgeon or another doctor didn't know him to be the surgeon at the time. And again, the only word that I understood out of his mouth was surgery. And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, London, because there was no way I was going to have surgery in this rundown. It was one of my only rules in Russia, don't have surgery. If I get really sick or my family gets really sick, just up and leave. But he got Martin back on the phone in, in the middle of practice and, and Martin sort of said, look, He's saying your appendix is about to burst. If you're on the plane at a burst, you can die. But he found kind of confident he's done this before. <laughs> oh my God. So it was, look, it was really one of those from the minute I sort of said, okay, I've got to have it done. Um, you know, going and lying in a room of 40 odd people just on wooden tables and them dry shaving me in front of everybody, absolutely butt naked and rolling me down the hallways of the hospital. Yeah, again, butt naked um, into an operating theatre to that, honestly, it felt that my recollection's like one of those dolphin torches hanging from a chain on the roof and a whole <laughs> bunch of bloody bandages on the, on the floor. <laughs> and I honestly thought I was going to die. And they, they strapped my arms down. They, they put the, the needles in to put me to sleep. And I'll never forget the sound like, you know, when you go to the cutlery drawer and you start rattling, that sort of sound I heard. That, so I opened my eyes. Because that, that actually just put the the, the anti you know, the, the, the antiseptic all over me and I'd been dry shaven, so I was swinging like crazy. So all I did was close my eyes and try to relax. Yeah. And I looked up and the surgeon had the scalpel right above my appendix ready to go and I just started yelling at him. And I just saw these two big eyes between his mask and his you know, head mask, whatever it was called, open wide. He started yelling at the nurse and the nurse started yelling back and I didn't know what they were saying, but she went and found another IV from somewhere and put it in my other arm and, and God, I, I couldn't have tried harder to stay awake and it was one of the scariest things I've ever had. And, um, you know, I woke up clearly and I'm still here, um, but I'll tell you what, they told me, and over there, there are no antibiotic tablets. So I had to stay in hospital for a week, but, um, the minute I could get out of hospital, I had another two weeks until I could play. I jumped on an aeroplane. I flew to Dallas and reconnected with some of the old team doctors from the Mavericks just to give me a, a very thorough going over to make sure they hadn't left a towel or a razor or something in there because I really <laughs> didn't trust them. And I thought, if I come back home to Australia and go to my doctors, I don't think I'll ever come back. So, look, it all worked out okay. Um but it was genuinely as scared as I've ever been. Oh, mate. It, it, I mean, straight out of a movie, isn't it? It's just absolutely incredible. <laughs> oh, mate. I mean, just, I mean, I, I'm always fascinated with Russia. I've got a friend because I think, um, is it is it Kazan? Is that is that how you pronounce the... the yeah, Kazan, I was at, Kazan. Yes. I always think of like the Shaq movie, Kazam. <laughs> 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 but I've, I've got a friend of mine, and actually just for people listening... Um, Andrew Craig, who's been on the podcast a few times, and uh, he's a musician and a good friend of mine, but he uh, lived, lived there for a year teaching English, and just reading your stories and just some of, like, just your feelings about the place um, and what his experiences were, um, and even just reading Adam's post from yesterday as well, it's just interesting just to get those different perspectives on of a place that a lot of, you know, Westerners don't get to go to, and especially Australians. So, I think one of the questions I was going to ask you is... Um, you know, playing there and playing in Russia in general, I mean, what what was it like sort of working in a system that's obviously not predominantly English, um, a completely different culture, um, and sort of coming from, you know, a lot of Western sort of, especially basketball and just sporting systems. Was that a massive culture shock for you to be able to adjust? And did it take a long time to sort of 
wrap your head around how things work over there? Yeah, it, it really did. And the, the biggest one initially was the language. Um, very, very few people spoke English and myself and Eddie Shannon, who was the other import on the team, um, we'd walk to the back of the lines of training and sort of learn by watching more so than learn by listening. We did have a translator, but we learned very quickly. We weren't getting full details. Um, you know, when you jump on a bus or you walk down the street, there's not a word of English written. It's a, it's a different dialect, different script that they write in. So we couldn't actually pick it up as we went. And, and then it started getting cold. You know, it got down to minus 45 yeah. degrees at times. And so that that all combined together. The, the, the one thing is it's, you know, it's a culture of extremes. There's, there's a lot, a lot of money held by a very small percentage of people. And outside of that, it becomes third world almost really, really quickly. So the extremes were, were eye-opening. Um, but I think the biggest thing when you talk to talk about adjusting is that here in Australia, especially as an athlete, we're very fortunate to be surrounded with a club, a staff, teammates, people, external, family and friends that we can lean on a little bit and they, they just, well, that's just stripped right away when you go over there and probably even more reason that I really enjoyed when, you know, when Adam and Mel came or when other friends or family came and visited that it really was an escape for a week or so and you could share what Russia was like and at the time, and I sort of still hold the belief that it's a little bit like you know, any any mum trying to describe childbirth, until you've done it, you can't explain it. Um, you just don't get it. And then to me, that was Russia. It's clearly a very different situation, but it's a really, really difficult thing to explain to someone who's never been there. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a fascinating place, and and I think you know any any opinion or sort of perspective that I have of the place is is just literally from whatever we see, whatever's documented, you know, documentary or or, or even just pop culture and things like that, and. Uh, and you know, it's it's certainly not a not a clear representation of what reality really is like over there. So yeah, it's it's always fascinating to get uh, people's perspectives. But um, as you said, un- unless you're there yourself and experiencing it, you're, you're not going to get the full the full understanding. Now, look at having said that, though, we, when you settle into it, it is it is amazing what you be, what you can become accustomed to. And if you had have told me after the first two or three months that I'd end up back there for for three years, I would have told you you're crazy because it was the hardest thing I'd done. And I you know, remember laying around in bed some nights up to three and four in the morning, just eyes open. What have I done? This <laughs> seems never ending. But, but, but the people that you slowly get to meet and the enjoyment you find when you do find people who speak English and your ability to connect with anyone um, was really, really interesting. And, uh, yeah, you can you can always tell the Russians who have travelled through basketball they're a little bit more worldly, they're a little bit more eyes wide open, a little bit more positive, and met some incredible people, learned some incredible lessons, and as tough as it was, it, you know, I'm really really glad I did it. There would have been every reason to to come home really quickly. Mm. And I think um, from what I can recall, you you won a championship um, in Kazan. Um, and I think it was, I think I read like online, it was like the first, the first in Russian history or something like that. It was, I mean, was there pressure for you coming, because this is your second Russian team as well. Was there pressure coming into that setting itself already being in Russia or are you sort of proving um, yourself a little bit? I, I think I'd proven myself. I, I'd made when I, when I played for, uh, so Ural great. I'd, I'd sort of made the Russian all import team and the all star five, and we'd made the championship series, and that was something not many people expected us to do. So, I guess my currency, for lack of a better term, in Russia was higher than it was in Spain and Italy, and perhaps some of the other places that I coveted going to. And at the end of the day, it's a nice thing to know that the team you're going to has seen a lot of you and they want you. and um, you know, Martin Mercep, who was my Dallas Mavericks and then my Ural great mate, he had gone and they sort of brought us across together. Um, so that, that made things easier. But, but as for pressure, not, not really because we were one of the top two or three teams. We had the biggest budget. We had a lot of depth of talent and we're, we were expected to win, but that didn't all fall on my shoulders. It fell on the European players who they'd brought in from other countries and, you know, Zhukowskis and Ilgo, you know, these sort of guys that we, we had a very, very good team. And as you said, we, we found a way to win the, the FIBA Europe Cup, which was the first European 
well, we were the first Russian team to win a European tournament in any sport uh, since Russia had been inducted into the European Union, which was an amazing night, an amazing moment, an amazing memory. Uh, but funnily enough, one that I share with very, very few people because mm. not no, no one knew it was happening. This was before social media. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, if anything, might have been one of my more memorable as insofar as in coming back to the Melbourne Tigers eventually was that I want to do what I do well in front of people that I know and love. You know, I'm doing this on the other side of the world for myself, but I want to share this with a few more people. Yeah, it must be it must be so isolating in a way because yeah, going back to what you said before about being people being able to relate to just your experiences that you're having, but then to be able to celebrate as well and just being sort of not only just on the other side of the world, but in in a relatively remote part of the world that often is not not known to a lot of people in west in in sort of the Western world. So uh, yeah, really uh, really unique. Yeah, look, it's so it is. It's you literally we, we jump on every every week. We jump on an old aeroplane and they pull the stairs down at the back of it. You know, it might be twenty or thirty seat aeroplane, and it, it was older. You know, every time I looked at it, it was as old as any as any plane I'd ever seen here in Australia. And you look out the window, and you know, we used to half joke about how many of these flights do we need to get on before one goes down and if it does will, will they ever find us because you're flying over the middle of the biggest continent in in, in the world um in sub-zero temperatures they just might not be bothered looking a- anymore um but, but it really was that it, it was <laughs> it was just a, a completely a different world. Just uh, I mean uh, just like when I sort of have a an overarching look of even just your professional career alone, there's so many sort of extremes that you've had. And I guess this is just an example of an extreme that's just in one completely different direction to everything else that you've experienced over over the past several decades. It's like just inc- incredible to sort of, I'm just imagining these old ex-Soviet uh, sort of commercial jets just uh, chugging away in the air there, just uh, just barely staying staying up in the sky. No, no, no the, 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 that's the thing though. You know, there'd be, there were three or four times over the, the years I was there where, We'd be flying late at night after a European game and, you know, it's sort of hitting 11, 12 o'clock at night. It's freezing cold. You're bumping through icy weather and you can't see the runway. You just hit it and then you you go and you stop and then you walk out and you think, this doesn't look familiar. And you've gone and landed in another airport four hours away because that was the only one that they could get to or find. The, The weather was too bad where we were, so... We'd sit at another airport at sort of 12 in the morning until 2 or 3 until they could organise a bus. And then a bus would get us at 3 in the morning and, and we'd drive back and we'd sort of get back to to Perm at, at 7 in the morning. And then you think, well, at least we get the morning off. And they said, well, no, we're on court at 10. <laughs> it, was just that, it was just that regimented and it was just you, you take it in your stride, you deal with it and I think you know, having going, having gone through things like that, and having that almost feel normal. I, again, I, when when I got back to Melbourne, I was the most appreciative, least complaining person I <laughs> reckon they might have got. And everything you know, I was now comparing through a different lens to my Russian experience and what I would have been comparing to say the NBA that where I was you know years before that. Oh man, yeah, incredible, incredible. I mean, it's such a, it's a it's sort of a. A blessing in a way because in in hindsight to be able to give you that perspective where you can sort of look at the things that normally bother us and and irritate us and in the grand scheme of things it's not it's not that bad after all we can actually deal with it that's exactly right so um you mentioned sort of melbourne melbourne tigers when you came back as well um i've been really lucky uh to have seen you play in the nbl as well as the nba um, I saw in the NBL, I think I only got to see you play when you were playing with the Magic and I was living in Brisbane at the time. So I got to see you uh, come up to and play the Bullets. And I saw one NBA game where uh, when you're playing with the Mavs and you came through LA and I saw you at the old forum um, yep. play and play uh, LA and uh, just some for me, like growing up and I've spoken about this with a lot of other other basketballers on the podcast, like it's it's such a, an amazing time for me, sort of the mid to late nineties where it was just a, a really cool era of, of basketball. And especially in Australia, like it was like this real, and I think it's sort of getting back to that, that point now um, where there's a lot of real fandom around basketball again, which is fantastic. Um, 
And while I will touch a little bit on the NBA stuff, and I'm always fascinated about people's experiences over there, what I'm really, really interested to find out is that first year when you came into the NBL and you joined the Melbourne Tigers, I mean, you had you had the Gazers, you had Leonard yep. Copeland, you had Mark Braghe, Um, and I, th- from what I can recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, they just came off a championship as well. What what was that culture? What was that dynamic? What was the, the chemistry? What was that whole thing? Especially for you, I, I'm if I get it right, you were a rookie coming in um, to the Melbourne Tigers. What what was this experience like, and the overall sort of feelings of coming into like this already established and well respected team? It was it was still surreal, um, and, and I say that, and I, I probably appreciated what they did less than anybody and I say that in so far as I did, I'd only been playing basketball now for two and a half years and, and I didn't know the history of the sport and I didn't know uh, I knew a little bit about Andrew Gaze but I, I didn't know who Dave Simmons and Leonard Copeland were um, so all I knew that I could have been coming into any basketball team but this was a team that happened to train after our under 20s team on a Sunday morning and every now and again, some of us under 20s would be invited to stick around and make up numbers and give them a third team. So as I slowly improved, as I guess quickly improved, um, I found myself to be one of them. And, you know, Simo and Brad Key and Robert Sibley used to beat the hell out of me. And I, I was a long, long way off. But, but at the same time, I was always, it seemed simplistic enough to me that Whatever Simo or even Hoags did, uh, you know, in a one-on-one situation, in a you know, in an individual, I, I could get close to their skill set, but I was nowhere near physical enough. And that that was the difference, and that was the thing I learned right from the start. That if I was going to be any good at basketball, I really needed to become a lot stronger, a lot more physical. I needed to find a weight room because to describe their culture, I suppose, especially with you know. The benefit of hindsight is that they were they were cohesive. They they had their system in place. They all fit into their roles really well, and they were comfortable doing what they did. They they recruited according to to requirement. Um, they brought in veterans who were at the top of their game, and they knew exactly what they were getting, which was a very different thing to where I ended up at the Magic, where they recruited talent and young players who wanted to develop and go somewhere. It was a very very different culture but two that in their own right have become or were both very successful over the years uh, and no doubt it probably would have been even more sort of uh striking as you got overseas and started playing in the nba as well because i think um one of the other stories that you'd shared a little while back was sort of coming into the bulls after you know a year or two post the second three-peat that they had and sort of that whole rebuilding and and what appeared to be a bit of a mess with them trying to try to reestablish a team and get it back back up and running um, no doubt sort of thinking about those experiences overseas and then sort of looking back on those sort of earlier days in the NBL those those first couple of teams I mean I guess it'd be quite striking as far as you know rebuilding and structure and culture and and trying to get a cohesive sort of system in place to try and get people on the same page I mean no doubt there'd be some you know some striking sort of uh, differences. Yeah, there, there were, and as I meant, yeah, the, the Tigers, as we said, were, were really cohesive. They knew their, what they needed, and it was very clear when you walked in what your role was. The Magic had the best culture of any basketball team I've ever been a part of. It, it was hard working. It was all about uh, personal best. It was tight. We, we were all young, and we all had places to go. Uh, and, and then after that, when you follow that, you know, the Dallas Mavericks, when I, when I landed there and I had to prove myself and – we weren't very good, so everybody wanted to take the opportunity to be the man on an NBA team, and that Michael Finley was that for us. You know, it was a bit of a, a battle for for that role, and the, the Bulls was that magnified, is that everyone with any ability had left outside of Tony Kukoc. Mm. And so now Elton Brand came in as a rookie, Ron Artest, Ron Artest came in, a rookie, in as a rookie, and Everyone on the team saw it as their opportunity to, to take that next big step into a much more significant role. And you know, there's, I don't blame them for doing it. I was doing the same thing. But it's certainly not a way that you can you can succeed and win many games because we're essentially all battling against each other instead of pulling in the same direction. Um, so, yeah, my three years in the NBA were around teams that were really battling. 
you know, the Mavericks, I, I still am very, very happy sitting down and watching how well they've done, how well Dirk did after I left and how well the club continues to do because it's, it's not hard for me to remember how much they battled and how off the NBA radar they were for, for so many years. Um, so to do what they've done has been incredible. Yeah, I, 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 I remember the... I was looking at the roster the other day from um, the game that I saw in LA and um, and just amazing to see like a lot of players on that team, on, on your team on the Mavs where they come from a lot of different places as well. Um, and I think sort of just touching on what you said, I guess no doubt, you know, and, and probably more sort of amplified in the Bulls given the Bulls legacy and probably a lot of pressure just to try and create the next era or the next legacy of the, of the, uh, of the team. But just so many so many people dragging in their their egos just to try and find their spots and try and find their their spotlight but um sort of you know working in more of an individual uh capacity rather than sort of trying to find everyone's strengths and weaknesses and and melting them together that's exactly what it was and it's uh, the more change over you have in in lists or playing lists over the years or over each year it, the harder it becomes and it's a really easy thing to do for for sporting clubs of any code that when you're not going well to make change, whether it be the coaches or players or both, where in fact sometimes the best thing you can do is continue to stay strong with the group and give them shared experiences together. You know, a year or two of shared experience with of shared experience with a less talented team is often more beneficial than bringing in more talent and turning it over and giving them no shared experience. So look, it was it was a tricky three years in the NBA. Again, I was still brand new to the sport, so I probably didn't appreciate the battle or how I should approach it as well as what I did now or as well as what I would now. Um, so it's always interesting when you speak to people who have either been over there or going over there and relate back. It's a, often the advice you give is very different to how you actually handled it yourself. And sometimes that's uh, a little bit disappointing because you would have loved to have had that advice coming over, but I think that's the thing when you do something for the first time. And, you know, Luke Longley was great to me over there, but he'd been through the college system and knew it. No one from the NBL had been before um, and been or been drafted before and had a, any years of experience. So it was tricky and I was trying to figure it out on my own. And at times I got it right, at times I got it wrong. But uh, again, it was very, very memorable. I remember, you know, as a, as a kid, um, seeing the announcement of, of you going to the NBA and I think at least from my point of view still really being a novelty of like yeah like an, another Aussie's managed to, to to crack it get over there um, and obviously these days now it's like it's a completely different world there's so many Aussies playing and playing at such a high level and and there's legacy now there now but um, at the time did you did you personally feel like it was a bit of a like, and novelty is probably not the right word, but I guess that's the word I'll, I'll stick with for the time being. But did you feel like it was it was unique and and still of a novelty for you to be able to get this opportunity at the time to get over there and be drafted? Yeah, it was. It's it's interesting the way you remember things. Is that the, the first thing I felt was actually outside of the excitement, right in the initial moments, was guilt because I'd I'd played with Sam McKinnon and Jason Smith and. Mm had been a part of that under 23s just in a lead up capacity leading up to the draft and I certainly didn't feel like I was the best player in the country and I didn't I felt like there were guys better than me and mates of mine who were better than me that would have died to have the opportunity that I'd just been handed um, so there was a little bit of, of guilt there but it was, it was it was interesting though and I think the way we approach it or, or view it now is very different because I actually moved house recently and came across some old articles. And when I was writing my book, I'd, I'd dig back over a couple of old articles. And uh, when I reread some of some of the things that were written, it was amazing how much of the God, this kid's no good. He's he's going to get eaten alive over there. He's not going to do well. He's going to fail. It, it was all that, and I do remember that at the time. But that that was a bit of a driving factor for me. That not that it drove not that it drove me to succeed. But I thought, geez, it would be nice to have a little bit of support but <laughs> it's also part of the it's also part of I suppose the learning that you keep those close to you really close and you take their opinions on board whether good or bad and the rest you just let fly by um, so no look I mean it's that was one of my first thoughts when you know I'd, I'd, I'd become a starter in my first year I'd played some games for the Mavericks yeah, we'd beaten the Bulls and I had, you know, had a career high. I had 26 points in a game against the Boston Celtics and that was probably 
when I started feeling like, okay, I, I think I can find a way to, to find a role here in the NBA. It didn't work out for as long as I wanted, but, you know, I was, I was really proud of some of the games I had and what I was able to do, especially for someone who'd only been playing basketball for four, you know, three and a half, four years coming into the NBA. It's uh, just mind blowing, and I think I'm um, not to uh, just a slight tangent, and something really interesting that people might uh, might get a kick out of is that you know I mean you mentioned a couple of times about you know not really having sort of this depth of experience with with basketball in general. I mean you're playing tennis, and and you were like playing and and training with uh, was it Mark Philippoussis? Uh, not so much training and playing with him. We'd we'd come across each other in tournaments. Uh, yeah, right. but- yeah, no, it was ironically one of the last matches I ever played. I, I beat Mark in the semi finals of a schoolboys <laughs> championship. I was, I was a year older than him. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a little bit similar to how we grade bastards two years at a time. So, essentially, I was top age and he was bottom age. But, yeah, making that final, I think I was a number eight seed and he would have been one or two and then losing in the final, but still never getting a look at, you know, Victorian and national teams and especially to play doubles and. You know, I think most people know by now I played doubles with Dustin Fletcher who mm. went on to play 400 AFL games for Essendon and we just didn't lose for, for year, years on end um, in any level tournament around the country and they just wouldn't take us away in a tournament. They'd, they'd take the two singles kids and put them together and we'd kind of chuckle because we'd beaten them every tournament and every tournament that we'd come across them. But I think tennis is in a different space now. They, you know, I think... The Woodies probably highlighted the ability to be double specialists, I suppose, and there have been plenty of them around. But now, look, by the time Dustin was 16, he went off and played AFL footy. You know, I, I traipsed along behind him and watched a couple of times early days, but, you know, found basketball through my younger brother and a couple of my uncles and happened to be seen playing a domestic game at Kiel Basketball Stadium and took him a few weeks to figure out where I lived or who I played for because they just assumed they'd find my junior club and get in contact with me through that, but I didn't have one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, look, it took me a while, but I found basketball in the end. Just, I mean, such an acceleration of, you know, obviously for, for you and, and especially that age, I mean, I'm just thinking of anyone sort of going through sort of that, that age bracket where there's just so much going on in your world. You're, you're trying to find your feet and try and work out where you fit into the world. And for you, no doubt having in the front of your mind like tennis and tennis has been a big part of your life and then suddenly all this interest and in, and this direction changing going into basketball and then accelerating at it like just just you know everything just happens so quickly it's i mean that's a that's a big mental sort of hurdle to sort of you know jump over yeah look it is um but, but I'll, I'll, i've always believed that one of the greatest benefits i had from picking up the game so late was i didn't have any uh, ingrained bad habits that I'd been doing things wrong for, for a decade. You know, I saw so many kids who were so much better than me and they'd make shots or they'd be a little bit stronger, but it just wasn't sustainable the way they were doing it. So sort of by the time I learned to run my lane and get to my spots and then even shoot a jump shot or shoot a free throw, I was building it from scratch. I wasn't doing it wrong. I didn't have to reprogram myself to do something completely different to how I'd been doing it for years. So I've always thought that was a benefit, um, you know, as, as I retired and, you know, jumping forward a long way, I see so many young kids who are great at under 14 and under 16 because they're just able to physically dominate. But you look and you think, if that's how they look or if that's how they move or if that's how they shoot in four years' time, it, it, that's just not going to hold up at the next level. But so many junior coaches coach to win junior tournaments now and they don't coach to develop habits of young players for later and I was very very fortunate that Des Middleton who was the Tigers junior coach coached me to be better later um Al Westover coached me to be better later and then by the time I got to Brian Gorge and he just poured kerosene on it and <laughs> you know we, we went to another level and and when you're talking about this sort of stuff are you, are you sort of referring more to technique or I assume probably part of it is also just um just general movement or even recovery as well, like you know, people taking care of their bodies? Yeah, it's both. It's definitely technique. It's definitely movement. But because I wasn't very good, I had to learn what spots to get to to get two or three shots a game. I, I wasn't going to get 15 shots a game, so I learned that if I set a good screen, I'd get a good shot. Or if I got a teammate open on a great screen, then they'd find me later on in the game. 
you know, I wasn't the sort of guy that ever stood on the wing and said, give me the ball and let me play. You know, I, I learned really early that you do you, you do 99% of your work in a game of basketball without the ball in your hands, but everyone only drills what to do when the ball is in your hands. Mm. So I learned to see the game pretty clearly right from the start and, you know, even to the extent where you know, the, the old Melbourne Tigers used to run the shuffle and if anyone knows the shuffle, it gets swung to the, the five man at the top every possession when you run thirds and mm. you pass it back on the draw your coach and you go and screen away. And 99% of centres who would guard that would stand in the middle of the lane and bump cutters. And I'd sort of stand there thinking, what if the big was able to shoot? Because they leave him wide open, but I think the bigs aren't allowed to shoot. So I just one day went down the back of the old Albert Park Stadium and, and started shooting threes from the top of the key. And I shot hundreds and hundreds of them. And then I did it every single day. And I, and I shot one at training one day and, and Lindsay looked at me and subbed me off and said, no, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so I went away and I, I kept shooting it because I was naive enough to think, well, if a guard's got the talent to shoot it, surely it's an uncontested shot. So I just kept going out the back and teaching myself to shoot the three and it was something that wasn't allowed to be done because, you know, how it goes, if, if nobody's doing it, if everyone believes something, that it must be true. But I kind of liked my naivety when I got into basketball and eventually shooting that three opened up a lot of other elements of my game later on in my career. And I mean, these days now to see a big taking taking those shots is is not unusual. It's 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 almost like a it's a part of the toolkit that's that's needed. Um, it's not just about the the old school traditional big man role in the paint. It's it's a it's a lot more sort of you know moving outside towards the arc and and hitting some of those longer shots. Yeah, I mean, people almost use being tall as a restraining criteria you know you're pretty fast for being tall you're a pretty good shooter for being tall i just wanted to be fast and i just wanted to be a good shooter I, I didn't think that had to be limited to being small to be able to do that um you know again going back to a lot of junior coaches they put they put big kids in a box and don't let them dribble and don't let them shoot and it kills them mm. so uh again i was very lucky that the coaches i had taught me the right way allowed me to expand my game out and uh yeah, look, by the time I got to the NBA, that 26-point that game I had against Boston, most of them were jump shots and, you know, some of the biggest shots I hit in my career, maybe the most important shots I hit in my career. You know, they're, they're not battling away inside in, a, in an NBA grand final series because you just don't get as many of them. But they were finding space away from the ball and knocking down jump shots. That, that was what I needed to be able to do to be successful. Mm. When uh, you mentioned uh, earlier about... Uh, leaning on different people um, coming into the NBA and Luke Luke Longley helped helped you a bit with uh, you know just trying to I guess for you to find your feet and get some direction and advice I mean what what sort of things did did Luke in particular or any of the guys that you lent on when you're coming into the NBA what sort of things did they share with you because no doubt coming from the NBL you know there's there's an element of pay involved there's an element of money involved but uh it's it's chalk and cheese compared to the nba and um, there's big egos big characters big money uh, big lights big everything um what what sort of things were sort of shared it was describing almost what you just described and then making sure you found time to get away from it hmm. because it can eat you up and it can consume you um part of my thing was always to make sure that all of my friends away from basketball I made the time for and found time to speak to on the phone or, or spend time with in Dallas uh, to escape from the game because there are so many games. Um, you, you don't have a lot of time to yourself. And as you say, there, there are so many egos, so much money it can be. You can get caught up. And I'm, I'm sure I did to periods of time. But uh, Luke was just that level voice, that level head and Again, it took me. I, I don't think I got to his place until after, or just before, after Christmas in my rookie year. And he invited me to his house and just to sit down and talk to him and, and walk into someone's house and not walk into his room. Um, and to hear another Aussie accent and to to talk about the AFL was incredible. And of course, all the advice he gave was uh, I'll take with me and I, or I took with me through my career. But um, I, I suppose that the thing for me was I'd never spoken a word to Luke. Um, he didn't need to call me or, or seek out my number when I got to Dallas, but he did. And th that's the sort of guy he is, that he was always as much about other people as he was his, uh, as he was himself. And 
I, I think you'll find that if you go back over the boomers history uh, and all the young guys that, that have played in the NBA, I'd be very, very surprised if most of them didn't receive a call from Luke while he was over there. He's definitely a, a unique individual. He's such a private guy and you don't, I mean, if you try to find, you know, interviews with him, they're, they're few and far between. He's a, he, he likes his privacy, but um, the, the reputation that he's carved out, putting aside his career, like his, the legacy of his career, I mean, just hearing stories from other people and their interactions with him, he, he just definitely sounds like a, a really important person and somebody who um, puts a lot of care into to others around him. He really is, and he, he sees basketball through a much broader lens than what most basketball players do. And I'll tell you what, we have this, an old, it's called Pete's Bar, and Pete's Bar used to be the bar at the back of the old Albert Park Stadium. When they knocked it down, there's a group of old basketball heads that, that catch up once a year and have this Pete's Bar lunch, and they we always get a, a speaker in. You know, Bruce Palmer spoke one year. I think Barry Barnes spoke one year. Timsey and Drewy have spoken, but Luke, spoke three years ago and in a room of basketball people it's hard to keep their attention for sort of more than 30 45 minutes because we're all there to catch up and we haven't seen each other in years but you know nigel purchase was interviewing luke and you look at your watch and you're an hour and a half in and then you look again there's another half hour and we're getting kicked out of the room and we could have stayed for hours he's the best storyteller best public speaker that I've heard. It, I mean, it, it's a shame that he hasn't spoken more and then more people don't get to hear it, but I have a feeling that he's going to be doing a little bit more, and I'll tell you what, if, if there's ever a chance to listen to Luke Longley speak in any forum, it's just well worth doing. Oh, I've um, I've certainly tried my luck and tried to, to hit him from a few different avenues, because he's not, um, obviously it's not just uh, go to lukelongley.com. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's very private, but, um, oh, look, if there's ever a glimpse of an opportunity to to, to hear some of those stories, whether it, whether it be me getting, getting a chance to talk to him or just hearing somebody else um, have those conversations with him, I, I think it'd just be, it'd be absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, just uh, but I mean that's that's one of these things where, at least from from my point of view, and I guess the era that I sort of really really loved and got into basketball, there's just so many great personalities and so many stories uh, where basketball really came into its own sort of in sort of the early to mid to late nineties. Um, there's just so much going on, so much activity, and I think, sort of, in hindsight now, looking back and reflecting, there's just so much, so much knowledge and and wisdom that has come out of that era. That um, is just, it always fascinates me to hear people sort of reflect back and sort of interpret um, interpret that time for sport, especially sort of a sport that was not, it was it was never the go-to sport in Australia. I mean, our, our sporting culture is you know footy and and cricket for the most part, and then and then it sort of trickles off after that. So. It's definitely interesting to to hear like these people sort of reflect back and and the lessons learnt and the and the wisdom that's come out of it. You, you know what I, I couldn't agree with you more. And ironically, you know, one of my projects through lockdown was I thought the exact same thing that I'm used to walking in the sports bars on a Friday or a Saturday or or reading about function. There are random retired AFL players turning up at every second pub and, and, and doing sportsman's days and nights. I thought, I wonder if basketball is big enough to stand on its own feet because I've heard so many of your stories and you sit back you know, with a beer and you listen and, and you're fascinated. So, yeah, I, I started building and we, and we did our first one when lockdown ended and we had Andrew Gaze and Leonard Copeland come down to a sporting globe in Morty Alec and we sold out in about a week and a half and you've never heard people laugh you know all the basketball heads came back together um some of the stories are incredible so like, like you say some of the lessons were incredible and it probably even reinforced even more that more people need to hear these basketball stories and it doesn't just need to be from the highest profile guys it needs to be from any of the characters any of the the mainstays through basketball in the 90s and you know, we're, we're doing another one with Josh Giddy and Warwick Giddy before mm. the NBA draft, and we think that's going to be a lot of fun. But you're spot on that the stories that, and, and the characters and the, the personalities that basketball's had sadly get lost a little bit because the clubs, that, especially in Melbourne, that these players played for don't exist anymore. They find the corporate world and they become just someone who used to play basketball. But put a microphone in their hands and let them talk, you get some of the most entertaining nights you can have, and it's... Again, it was something that I, and maybe again, because I am new to the sport and I, I wasn't jaded by the sport as a kid, I still want to hear these stories. So I sit all the way down the back and I listen. I have a great night. It's, it's been a lot of fun. 
Yeah, definitely envious of of what you're doing down there. I, I've, I saw the I saw from afar the the Gaze and Copeland one, and just thought, oh, that to to be a fly on the wall that just uh, looks incredible. <laughs> and especially, you know, those two personalities. I mean, they they work so well together on the court. They had the chemistry, but just the personalities just together and the dynamic would be just really entertaining to listen to them talk. It absolutely was. And like I said, so they, they were great. They were on stage for about an hour and 40 minutes and you, you, people didn't want to get up to go to the toilet. It, it was incredible. Um, again, it let us know that this is something we're going to continue to do it. And Yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm doing it, I'm building them, but I'm looking forward to sitting in the back of the room and just listening. Once, uh, once the preparation's all done and the organising's done, I can allow myself to be a basketball fan again and listen to some of the stories that sometimes occurred before I started the sport. A lot of them I probably haven't heard either and I get to be a fan again. I love it. I love it. And, um, and speaking of stories, so, you know, sort of alluded to it uh, throughout the chat, but um, I think sometime last year you, you started putting up some stories. You started like sharing some some sort of stories from your career, reflecting back, you know, extracting sort of these le- life lessons learnt in hindsight. And just, I mean, the stories are just incredible, well written. Um, and I mean, certainly just, you know, fired me up. I mean, just especially from a nostalgic <laughs> point of view, um, just thinking back to to all those exciting times as a, as a fan of basketball. But um to hear it through or read it through your lens um, is really fascinating. Did you did you already have the book sort of in motion, you know, working on it at that time when you started sharing these stories or were, were the stories sort of influencing the decision to go in the direction of a book? Yeah, the second way. They, they certainly influenced the decision. And even after I'd written five or six, uh, you know, more and more people started reading them. But the, the, the reason I wrote them and, and the reason I, you know, I speak at schools and I speak at various businesses and different things like that is that and the reason i got into coaching when i retired i never thought i'd be a coach was i understand how many great people i had around me you know whether they're coaches whether they're support staff whether they're club administrators and not everyone gets to hear these or the type of lessons i learned um it's more along the lines of the salesperson coach and parents and kids just don't know which direction to look at and I thought, you know, when I got into coaching, it's a good opportunity to share a lot of what I learnt and try to have some young athletes experience some of what I experienced. Um, and as I, you know, as I sat down at the start of lockdown, I thought, I'm, I'll, I'll put a couple down in, in writing. And like I said, four or five in and, and more and more people were reading them and there were a couple of little comments about you should put these into a book and mm. I, I brushed them aside, I brushed them aside and... <laughs> Eventually, it sort of became. I had some some of my mates who I really trusted. I, you, no, 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 you, you really should. So the hardest part, probably towards the end of it, was was writing more and more and not being able to share them um, because I wanted to collate them and put them into a book. But you know, I've said to people, I, I didn't think I'd read another book that long in my life again, let alone write one. But <laughs> but here we are. But now look, it's at the end of it it was a great experience it was a lot of fun i, I really love the lessons i've learned i've loved the stories I, i'm able to tell about what i've experienced but as we mentioned with luke and you know as with so many other people around around basketball there you know i love being able to talk about what they're like behind the scenes what i learned from them how that impacted me how i can pass it on to my kids or anyone who chooses to listen so it was, it was a wonderful project it's you know, it's out ready to go. So if anyone who's listening wants to go to my Facebook page, the link's on there, have a look. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing this to, to put in bookstores or anything like this. I'm doing it to share with anyone who cares to have a quick read. Oh, I, I mean, just those stories alone that you shared online were, you know, if, if it's anything in that direction, um, I, I think people will absolutely love it. And uh, <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a couple that I've doubled. I've put them straight in. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Don't waste them. Don't waste <laughs> no. them. <mate>. Bloody hell. <laughs> but I, I can't write that much as I could have done them all. Yeah. So there are some that you would have written, some that have been extended a little bit, but uh, no, it was, it was a great project. Yeah, excellent. Well, I'll, I'll chuck some links in the in the show notes of the episode so people can just click through and go and order the book and um and get get a, get amongst that. And I'm, I've ordered one, so I'm looking forward to to getting that in the post and and I digging into that. I just <laughs> um yeah, as I said, I think I think for me and and a lot of friends of mine, like it's so funny. So my 
my background or most of my identity is sort of like a sort of a late teenager into my twenties and thirties has been a musician playing music and especially like, you know, metal music. And it's so funny over the years, as you connect more and more with people in my sort of peer group, how many of them around my age all came out of this fanatical basketball era where we all collected cards, we all went to, um, you know, NBL games, we were all obsessed, we were all tr trying to take the NBA games that were on once a week at 11 o'clock at night or whatever it was, or Sports Tonight, you know, recaps and all that sort of stuff. And it's just amazing, even today, reminiscing about this stuff. So, you know, having this chat with you is really surreal. Um, it's it's awesome to sort of record these conversations along with some of the other guys I've had on because a lot of my mates who are just, you know, metal heads, they're metal musicians are going, oh, that's so cool. Um, and I hope that the book is sort of, you know, another way of sort of firing up a lot of these people who may have been a little bit disconnected from basketball over the past several years and are only just starting to find their feet again with the way that the NBL is promoting itself and expanding and, and getting bigger and better. And hopefully it just, it just reawakens that hunger of, uh, of just, you know, really reconnecting with how great basketball is. Yeah, I hope it is. And you know what, we're, we're old enough now that a lot of the guys that I played with have got kids coming through, including myself, you know, Andrew's got to Shane Hill's daughters over there. Mm. You know, a, well, clearly Ben and, and, and Cecil Exum have, have their own sons playing. So we're a generation ahead and, you're right, maybe it is a little bit about bridging that gap and making sure we we remember the past, we appreciate the past, we remember where we've come from and understand maybe why we do some of the things we do. But it's, uh, like I said, for me as someone who was new to the sport, it, it was fun to write. I came in even with this project a little bit naive, a little bit eyes wide open, and I didn't expect it to probably go as well as what it already has, but uh, I'm very happy that it has, and it's something that... Uh, Good already. I've even started writing a few notes down for, for a couple of other ideas, but uh, you just never know where, uh, I guess you never know where lockdown is going to take you because essentially it was my best COVID project that I could have imagined. I love it. I love, I love the, I love the positive stories that come out of this because there's been so many challenges and so much uh, stress that people have gone through and, and to hear some, hear some positivity that's come out of it and, and stuff that's, that's valuable for other people as well. It's going to, it's going to bring a lot of entertainment and, and value to, to people and hopefully a bit of uh, wisdom and insight and perspective and and yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it but um mate thank you so much thanks for giving me a bit of your time and i tell you, as we're talking and i was thinking about the times that i've seen you play um i reckon i've i've met you as a as a really short fat little kid um in brisbane uh, <laughs> after a game and i think uh, i think i've got a basketball card lying around somewhere where, where you've signed it so if i can find it I'm going to take a photo of it and chuck it, uh, chuck it in the show notes of, of the episode as well. But I, I'm bummed at the time we didn't get a, didn't get a photo together because that would have been just a, a, a real mind trip to, <laughs> to talk I'll, about. I'll, 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 tell, I'll tell you what, I'm COVID pending. I'm up in the Gold Coast with a bunch of South East Melbourne Magic teammates in the first week in November. So if we get up there, come and find me. We'll have the photo. Oh, mate. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, mate. We'll, uh, we'll speak soon. And uh, yeah, all the best with the book. And uh, yeah, looking forward to reading it. I appreciate it. Thanks for having the chat. All righty, friends. Go and pick up Chris's new book, Tall Tales, What the Whiteboard Never Taught Me. Uh, I'm going to have links in the show notes over at andysocial.net and andydowling.net, um, as well as the description of wh wherever you're listening to this through right now, whether it be on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, there should be a bunch of clickable links. So grab your grab your stubby little digits, smash them against the screen, and you should be able to click through and pick up a book straight away. I've got mine in transit. It, it hopefully will be here in the coming days. I'm, I'm just I'm so pumped to read it. So pumped to read it. And if you want just a, a glimpse or a bit more of an, uh, an understanding of what to expect from this book, um, in addition to just listening to this episode, uh, go to Chris's Facebook page. So it's uh, Chris Angsty 13 and I'll have links, of course, in the uh, show notes for Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for Chris. But uh, go to the Facebook page and just scroll through some of the, uh, the, the previous month's posts from Chris, and you'll find some just absolutely incredible stories and uh, stories that came, I think a lot of them were sort of being shared when uh, The Last Dance was out um, over uh, on Netflix, the uh, Chicago Bulls uh, series. And um, there's a there's a particular part in The Last Dance where Chris is just just featured ever so ever so slightly, uh, where he's uh, giving an elbow to Dennis Rodman. And uh, man, 
just iconic. So, so cool. So um, there's great stories over there. So that'll give you a taste and hopefully will motivate you to go and pick up the book. But I reckon that episode alone should be should be more than enough to get you fired up to go and pick up a copy of the book. But uh, yeah, really, really cool stuff. So I'll have everything in the show notes, andysocial.net, andydowling.net in the description. Go and check it all out. And a massive thanks to Chris. And please, um, guys, if you're, if you're new to the podcast and, well, you're hearing me waffle on now, thank you so much for copying and ear bashing from me. But uh, go back and listen to some of the previous uh Basketball legends I've had on the podcast, uh, Shane Heal, Leroy Loggins, Derek Rucker, uh, Mark Davis, uh, Adam Ballinger, and I'm sure there's a few other people that I've completely forgotten. My apologies. But uh, the list is growing. It's getting bigger and better, and I am, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and get more and more of these greats on the podcast. So just stoked to be able to have Chris on and, and share some of these stories with me. It's just surreal stuff, guys, surreal stuff. So um, – Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of thank yous, Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Best way to support this podcast. Um, I am in the process of doing a bit of an overhaul with Patreon. going to just adjust the tiers and change things up, you know, keep it fresh. But uh, my goal for this year is to get as many $1 supporters as possible. So it's $1 a month, nothing, set and forget. You won't even notice it. And at the moment, you don't really get anything for a buck. You just get a warm and fuzzy feeling. Support the scene. Support your mate Andy. Back him. Back him with his little podcast. But uh, that might change. I might uh, start offering a few things for the $1 supporters as well. So uh, get on board. Support me that way. It's, it's a, an amazing way. It is a really effective way, significant way of contributing to the podcast, even if it just feels like it's a dollar a month and that's it. It's, it does so many more things. And uh, if you want access to additional tiers, uh, the weekly Patreon podcast episode, or uh, giveaways and free stuff. I've got free t-shirts and, and I get a bunch of stuff in the mail as well, like uh, stuff from bands and just different things. Um, and I always want to give first dibs to the Patreon community. So um, it's a great way to sort of get access to some of this stuff before everybody else does. So go and check it all out over at patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. And a little thank you to my top tier supporters. These guys are in my top two tiers. They throw probably a little bit too much money at me uh, each month. Uh, it's a little bit, it's... It's nice. I'm not complaining, but whew, guys, that's, that's a bit of pressure. But uh, these guys are just amazing, um, and they significantly contribute to the rolling costs of running a podcast, the hosting, the production, the gear, getting around town, starting to do that a bit more now, and just helps me take the focus away from all that kind of stuff and helps me really lock in and have great conversations with people like Chris on this episode. So a massive thank you in particular to these people, Andrew from Perth, Mick G from Sydney, Ash from Daniloquin, Dan from Dapto. Rod from Ray Lee in North Carolina, Patrick from Canberra, Liam from Brisbane, Chris from Sydney, Brendo from Leeton, Tim from Canberra, James from Brisbane, Christian from Canberra, Steve from the Gold Coast, and Andrew from Sydney. Thank you, guys. And these guys are part of the wider uh, group of just legends, awesome people that are supporting me over at Patreon. So go and check it out, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Um, now, next episode, can't tell you. Can't tell you, so it'll be a surprise for all of us. So stay tuned. Until then, folks, take care and ta-ta. Larry.